All right, I'm going to start out. I'm going to say, he is risen. You say, he is risen indeed, okay? He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's stand together as we praise him this morning. As cruel as a grave, shame is a robber, and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer, lift me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found.
let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of our praise. Worthy is the One who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance. Let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is our praise. Worthy is the One who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance. Let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of the praise. Worthy is the One who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance. Let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. If you walk down to the grave, I'm walking to I'm walking to you. I'm walking to you. If you walk down to the grave, I'm walking to you. If you walk down to the grave, I'm walking to you. If you walk down to the grave, I'm walking to you. There ain't no Resurrection Sunday. I got a couple of quick announcements and then you guys will be done with me. Um, if you guys are visitors here first or second or third time and you've never filled out one of these little tabs in your bulletin, if you would do that, we would love to have a record of you guys being here and we have a gift that we want to give you. So if you would, fill these out and then on your way out, there's an offering box in the back right there. Just go ahead and drop those in. We'd really appreciate that. And then two really quick announcements. Um, we are not doing kids' church like we normally do. It is down in the gym today. So ages four up through fifth grade will be down in the gym. If you guys want your kids to go down there, you can do that now, or most of you probably have. And nursery is going to be how it normally is from birth to three years old. So, and I have nursery today, so uh, pray for me. I'm going to be in there. So, uh, yep. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> The other announcement we have is for the daddy-daughter dinner. It's going to be this upcoming Friday. I'm really excited about that. It's a good time. Bob's going to be talking. Um, so if you don't get enough of him today, you can get enough of him on Friday night. Uh, he will be brief in that, I promise. And then uh, it's going to be all-you-can-eat chicken. And uh, we just want to show girls today from any age, it doesn't matter if they're 8 years old or 80 years old, that they are valuable. And uh, we as fathers need to show our daughters that because the world doesn't tell them that anymore and they are very valuable. So we're gonna have a good time with that. There'll be photo sessions and there'll be a place to dance with your daughter. And, and did I say all you could eat fried chicken? So, hey, we're Baptists, that helps, doesn't it? Uh, so sign up sheets are on the table back over here on the, at the activity center. Make sure you're signing up for that. Last year we had a great time. So uh, let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you, and I want to thank you, Lord, for just being such an amazing God, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice, Lord. Thank you for conquering death, hell, and the grave and giving me an opportunity to spend eternity with you in heaven, Lord. I just thank you so much for that gift, Lord. We take it for granted every day. And Lord, I ask you to bless our service. Please be with the worship, Lord. Um, Lord, it's just so important, Lord. People don't realize how important worship is. So I just ask you to help us to take it seriously, Lord, and honor you and glorify you in that, Lord. And Lord, I ask you to be with Bob as he preaches. Give him a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit power, Lord. Give him the words to say. Help him to be your mouthpiece. And Lord, I ask you to draw a circle around each and every one of us as we sit here today and listen to your message. I ask you to convict us, Lord. I ask us to honor you. Thank you for all you do in advance. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. 
You ever wonder who came up with eggs and bunnies to uh, celebrate Easter? Kind of a contradiction in terms, isn't it? I mean, I guess I could Google who did it, but who wants to work that hard? <laughs> whoa, whoa, all right, oh, we're doing this now, okay, all right. And to be honest, I don't really care who came up with it because there is something just a little bit magical about popping open one of these eggs, am I right? I mean, anything can be in here. Toy, candy, money. And then occasionally, you have the unfortunate luck of finding the empty one. <laughs> Maybe an empty egg is a better symbol for Easter than a full one. Oh, okay. Take the very first Easter morning, all right? Uh, we have hindsight as our benefit, but Jesus' disciples, they, they were so confused of what was going on. They didn't even have a clue. <laughs> okay, so Mary Magdalene, she gets to the tomb first, and she goes inside, and what does she see? It's empty. She is completely distressed. So she runs to John and Peter, and they go to the tomb, and what do they see? Empty. Empty is a, uh, a negative word, isn't it? My stomach is empty. The gas tank is empty. The house, since the kids left, it's empty. Empty just feels like disappointment. And on that very first Easter morning, nobody knew the word empty better than Jesus' followers. They had empty hearts. And they had empty hope. I got you, buddy. You see, the thing about Jesus, he takes empty things and he fills them. Empty tombs become resurrected miracles. Empty hearts get filled with love and empty hope overflows with everlasting purpose. Yes, Jesus specializes in empty. Here you go, buddy. Jesus emptied himself for our sake, that we may be filled with love, meant to save the world. I don't know about you, but nowadays, when it seems like we wake up and we are more isolated, alone, empty. But maybe this Easter, between all the eggs and the bunnies and the beans and every other activity, can I ask you a question? Will you allow Jesus to come into your emptiness. Let's stand.
because he rose, he's our living hope, right?
Amen. Yes. Well, I'm excited to be able to share with you here on this Easter Sunday. Our lead pastor, Roger Johnson, asked me uh, a while back if I would do that. I'd rather hear Roger preach. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and, but uh, a great honor to be able to do that uh, today. And we all know this is the day that we celebrate the resurrection. This is the day that even though every day as a follower of Jesus, we identify with the resurrection, right? But this is the day that we, with a heightened awareness, stop and pause and say, man, aren't we thankful that Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? Amen. And so we're so uh, thankful for that. So, but I want you to know Christianity, those that follow Jesus is the only world religion that's not based on a system of works. And what I mean by that is there's not a list of boxes you need to check to see if you're going to get into heaven. Now, I didn't surrender to Christ until I was 24 years old, even though I'd been raised in a Christian church. But I can tell you, until I was 24, I kind of had the idea that there must be balancing scales somewhere in heaven. If I did more good stuff than bad stuff, I'd squeak into heaven by the skin of my teeth. If I did more bad than good, then, uh, you know, I'd have to go to hell. And it makes sense humanistically, doesn't it? It just makes sense. Seems like we ought to have to have some skin in the game. But thankfully, here's what Christianity states and states clearly. We're all sinners, and because of that, we're separated from God. God is so holy, so pure, so clean, and how else would he be? I mean, he's God, right? He's so incredibly clean. What I would view as the least of my sin completely separates me from him. I don't have any shot whatsoever in my own strength as a human being of getting myself to heaven. As a matter of fact, I have to go to hell. So I needed to be rescued, and not 99% of the way, because again, if there was one iota of sin, it disqualifies us. I need to be rescued 100% of the way. And you know what? We're born that way. From the moment we're born, we need to be rescued. Now, the Bible does teach that if uh, someone dies, uh, God forbid, while they're a baby, they're covered. And we see that in passages where David, King David, lost his baby boy. And uh, he had died, and he said, you cannot come to me, but I'll go to you one day. So we know that. We know that we're knit together, the Bible says, in our mother's wombs. And so even the tragedy and the crisis of a miscarriage, those uh, uh, those souls go on uh, to heaven without a doubt. If you have someone in your life, like I do, that uh, will never reach the age of what we call accountability, understanding right and wrong because of a learning delay, even into the adult years. We know Bible, the Bible teaches clearly that those people are covered uh, just by the grace of God. But for you and I who get to the age that we understand right from wrong, I'm telling you, we are separated, separated, separated from God, and we don't have any shot of getting to heaven on our own strength outside of a rescue. So he sent the rescue. He sent his son, Jesus, born of a virgin, walked this earth for 33 years, 100% God, yet 100% man, who died on a cross. His blood was shed because the only thing big enough to cover my wicked sin was the blood of Jesus. He rose from the dead on the third day, which is what we celebrate today. And whenever he did those things, he paid our sin debt in full. If we're willing to simply come before him and say, God, I'm stuck, I'm helpless, I'm hopeless. I can't even take a baby step toward you. I can't become religious enough to get to you. I can't be Baptist enough or Methodist enough or Catholic enough or non-denominational enough. I can't do anything on my own because I'm a sinner. And as long as there's any glance of sin in my life, I have to go to hell. So I need to be rescued. I believe you sent the rescuer, God, your son, Jesus. And I surrendered as sincerely as I know how. I surrender. Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. And the blood that was shed for us is suddenly activated to cover our sin. And the only thing that gives us favor with God is the blood. That's it. If I go tomorrow and share Jesus with five people, give money to the poor, help three little ladies across the street, God's going to love me. If I go tomorrow and blow it in every way, God's going to love me. It's unconditional love, and we can't fathom that hardly as human beings. Now, I want to live a life that brings honor and glory to God, and if we ever just want to live like the devil and we don't have any conviction, we better check our source, right? But why do we want to live a, a life that would bring honor and glory to God? To show him that we appreciate the fact that we're in his favor regardless He's given us his favor if we've surrendered our life as sincerely as we know how to his son Jesus. So I want to tell you, where every other religion has a system of works that you better check off, Christianity is based not on works, but on a gift. It's based on the person of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. But what do we base that on? What is the evidence of that? Well, we base it on this book, the Bible. And you know what? Everything we base... This, what I just shared with you, is from this book. So how do we know this book is valid? How do we know? Because this book has some big claims. 
I mean, it claims a virgin had a baby, that Jesus was here 100% God, yet 100% man. There are some huge claims in this book. How do we know that it really is dependable? And I'm thankful that actually we have this book because we base it on this book. We don't base it on my philosophy or three generations back that told me a story and I just continue to pass it on. We, we, we base it on a, on a faithful, dependable document that can be proven. It's not a document that was put together in 631 AD. It's not a document that was put together in 1830 AD. It's a document that predates even the day of Christ, and it can be proven. And I want to talk to you just a little bit this morning about the validity of the Bible. If we believe this story, then where does it come from, and how can we really believe that it's true? So I want to talk to you, the first of all, about the verses, and you have a handout if you were able to get a bulletin this morning. Uh, you have a handout, uh, and you can look at the very first one. These are the verses that make me go, hmm, okay? This is what I call the verses that make me go, hmm. Everybody say, hmm. <laughs> say, hmm. Say, hmm. Yeah, you're with me, okay? So they're the verses that make me scratch my head a little bit and say, okay, wait a second. There's got to be something more to this, okay? And the first one is Job 26.7. Listen to what it says in Job 26.7 as it's on the screen here. He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Say nothing. nothing. Say nothing. <laughs> he hangs the earth on nothing. Now, many scholars believe that Job was the first writing of the Bible, even written prior to the book of Genesis. Many people, and I would agree with this, and I've got some reasons why, but I can tell you, I believe it was written somewhere between 18 and 1900 B.C. 18 and 1900 B.C. And I have to ask myself the question, how did I come to believe that this earth was suspended in outer space, that he hangs the earth on nothing? Here's how it happened for me. I was born June 13th, 1962, and they brought me home the very next day, June 14th. I'll never forget. You guys remember the day you were brought home from the hospital, right? It was a very monumental day for me. They had a bunch of flags up. I assume those were for me. But anyhow, I can tell you that we went, and my mom laid me in a crib, and I remember after a little while, I actually rolled over. That was one of the coolest moments of my life. Pretty soon, I started to set up. Then I got on my hands and knees, started rocking. They put me out of the crib and put me on the ground. I started crawling. I'll never forget the day I started crawling. Finally, one day, I walked up to a coffee table, and I pulled my Myself up and I stepped back a couple feet and I went like this and I thought I bet this earth is suspended in outer space. That's how it happened to me, right? Hey, listen, if it wasn't for modern invention, we would not have a clue. But the reason why this verse makes me go, hmm, say hmm, is because how in the world would the writer of Job know 18 to 1900 B.C.? that this earth was suspended in outer space. I don't believe it even made sense whenever the person wrote that. I believe what it proves and shows is that the writer of Job was God. Job was only the human instrument that was pinning those words, but God is the true author. The next verse, quickly, it makes me go, hmm, okay? And there are many Bible verses that make me go, hmm, but I'm just going to share a few, okay? So uh, here we are in, in uh, Isaiah 40, 22. Isaiah 40, 22. Listen to what it says. It says, and he who sets above the circle, say circle, circle. say circle. And he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. I, here we are looking at a verse that says, He, God, who sits above the circle of the earth. In the original language, the word circle means sphere. It means globe. Now, I have to ask the question again, how in the world would Isaiah in 742 B.C. have any idea that this earth was a globe, was a sphere, was a circle? Matter of fact, I remember learning a little rhyme, and you already know where I'm going. Whenever I was in school, it said something like this. In 1492, Columbus, and everybody was saying what? Man, you're going to sell right off this flat thing. That was still the idea. Not that many years ago in the history of the world, okay? But yet in 742 B.C., Isaiah knew it was round. I don't even think it made sense when Isaiah penned those words because Isaiah was not the author of the book of Isaiah. He was only the human instrument and the one true God that knew everything about this universe is the one that, that was the true author. The next verse that makes me go, hmm, uh, is Leviticus chapter 13, verse 46. There was something we've all studied in history called the bubonic plague, the black death. It went on from 1346 to 1353. 1346 to 1353. And in those years, an estimated 75 to 200 million people died across North Af Africa in what's called uh, Euro Asia, which is Europe and different areas around the world. Unbelievable. They said one in four people died. One in four in Europe. Uh, it's crazy. But I'm going to tell you what brought it to a halt. 
The church brought it to a halt whenever they came across this passage here in Leviticus 13, 46. And listen to what it says. He shall be unclean. All the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone. Say alone. alone. Say alone. alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Say outside. outside. So I want to tell you what that is. That's quarantine. And for the very first time, you see, nobody knew at that day and age that I could go like this. <laughs> And these little invisible things, they won't go that far, okay, so please. Would all of a sudden hit Vic, okay, and he would inhale one of those, and tomorrow he's going, <laughs> okay? Nobody knew that, and we wouldn't either if it wasn't for modern invention. So in the area of microcology, whenever you know all these, all these invisible germs and all these, if you're around somebody that's sick, you can get that. They didn't know it, but suddenly somebody came across this passage of Scripture and said, let's separate the sick from the well. In a matter of weeks, the bubonic plague came to a close. Now, another verse that causes me to go, hmm, is the very next one listed on your sheet, Numbers 19, 14 through 19. There was a doctor by the name of Semmelweis that in the 1800s was in Vienna. And he only lived to be 46 years old, but he's accredited to a lot of things. And one of the things was this. He had an unusual job, and that was to go from birth to death, or actually from death to birth. So he took care of everybody in the morgue, and then he would immediately go out whenever there was a need and deliver a baby. And he found that one in eight babies were dying shortly after they were born. One in eight. And he began to research, and he came across this passage of Scripture, and he added one thing to his routine. He would stop after inspecting somebody from, from the morgue and wash his hands in running water. And then he would deliver the baby. And the death rate dropped from 1 in 8 to 1 in 86 just by stopping and washing his hands. Now, we sat here today in 2023 and go, who wouldn't wash their hands after handling somebody that, was, that would, had died? But again, if it wasn't for modern invention, we wouldn't know. And he was the first one to begin to do that. So I used to read passages like this in the book of Numbers, and I would just kind of think it was some kind of religious stuff that God had said do it, and it didn't matter if it didn't make sense. If they wanted to show obedience, they were to do it. But now I begin reading these passages through the lens of germs, through the lens of keeping people healthy. I believe the reason why God wrote this passage I'm getting ready to read to you here in a moment in, in Numbers chapter uh, 19 is because he was saying, look, I know everything, and sin came into the world, and whenever sin came into the world, illness came into the world, and I know about these invisible germs and all that kind of stuff, and so if you follow these, these things that I'm t giving you right now, you're going to live. I'm trying to keep you healthy. I'm trying to keep you alive. And so listen to what it says in Numbers chapter 19, beginning verse, 9, verse 14. It says, this is a law... <clears throat> when a man dies in a tent. So we got that, right? A man has died in a tent. So this is a law when a man dies in the tent. All who come into the tent and all who are in the tent shall be unclean for seven days. Seven days. Now you can Google and you can find out how long it takes for infection to die and you'll find that it's seven days. Now, if you begin to look at how long it lasts on different surfaces and all that kind of stuff. You'll see there's a, a plethora. But I'm telling you, medical journals have proven time after time after time that the magic day for somebody who is ill to stay away from everybody is a seven-day time frame. And so here's what he said. He said, listen, if a man dies in a tent, anybody that was in the tent whenever he died, maybe that was caring for him, anybody that walks into the tent and out of the tent after he dies, they're unclean for seven days. Why? Get away from people to allow time for the germs to die so you don't give it to everybody else because who knows what the guy died from. So listen to verse 15. And every open vessel which has no cover fastened on it is unclean. So if your jar of peanut butter has the lid off when the guy dies or was in there deathly ill, throw it away, okay? If it's sealed, if any kind of vessel was open, those invisible germs, God knew, whatever the guy was dying from could go into that vessel. But if it was sealed, it was okay. Otherwise, you needed to pitch it. Verse 16, whoever is in the open field and touches one who was slain by the sword, there was a lot of battles back then as there is today, or, or who has died, or the bone of a man, or a grave shall be unclean for seven days. There it is again. Say seven days. And for, that, and for an unclean person, they shall take some of the ashes of a burnt heifer for purification from sins, and running water shall be put on them as a vessel. 
or in a vessel. Listen to verse 18. And a clean person, so somebody who hadn't been around the person who had died, a clean person shall take hyssop, and that was the strongest type of vinegar, if you would, uh, disinfectant they would have had of that day. So we'll take a, a hyssop and dip it in water and sprinkle it on the tent and on the vessels and on the persons who were in there or on the one who touched the bone, the slain, the dead, or a grave. Then the clean person shall sprinkle the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day. And on the seventh day, the clean person shall purify himself, wash his clothes, bathe in water, and he'll be clean that evening. The reason why God was saying all that is because he was saying, listen, I know about illness and I know about germs and I know about the stuff you don't have any idea about yet. But somehow, Moses, in about 1440 B.C., he knew this? See, I don't buy it. I don't even think it made sense whenever he wrote it down. Uh, because Moses wasn't the author. He was only the human instrument. But the author was God. The one true God. That brings me to the next verse. I wish we had time to go through many of these. But Genesis 17, 12. Listen to what it says. It says, uh, he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from, from 80 foreigners, so maybe somebody that was adopted or obtained some other way, who is not of your descent. So it's saying, listen, on the eighth day after a baby boy is born, have him circumcised. Now, a part of that was Judean custom because they wanted to ensure that that baby boy would be alive for one Sabbath prior to being circumcised. But if you look at medical journals today, here's what they found out. Whenever a baby boy is born, his blood has a better ability to clot on day eight than any other time in his, in his life. I'm talking from days 1 to 7. I'm talking from days 9 to 109 years old if he lives to be that long. It's because of something called vitamin K which takes about 5 to 7 days to begin to develop and there's a secondary thing that causes a clot that actually jumps to 110% in their level on day 8 and then jumps back down to 100% on days 9 and following. So it's amazing to me that God in about 1440 BC said to Moses, hey on the 8th day now, why would he do that? Today, of course, we have babies that are, you know, circumcised on about day one or two because they've got ability to be able to make blood to clot, okay? And usually that's associated with adding vitamin K. But it takes this amount of time, no matter if that baby's born early, if he goes full term, something about the eighth day after oxygen begins to hit him, his body has a better ability to clot than any other time. Now, how in the world would Moses know this? I don't believe he did. But I believe the one true God that created all of us and created everything and knows everything spoke it because he's the author, God. And Moses was only the human instrument. Those are just a few verses that make me go, hmm, okay? But I want to talk about the unity of the Bible as well. You can see there on the next part of your sheet, it's one book comprised of 66 smaller books. It was written by 40 different authors, so 40 different human instruments. They lived over a 1,600-year time span. Think about that. Before the latter authors were ever born, the early authors had been dead for hundreds of years. They lived on three separate continents. That would be Europe and Asia and Africa. On those three continents, it represented 13 different countries. They had many different heart languages. They had many different backgrounds. Some were the poorest of the poor, like shepherds and, uh, and fishermen. Others were scholars and kings. We've got a doctor in there. We've got soldiers. Yet their notes match identically. If they were living at the same time on planet Earth, you didn't get on a jet back then and fly from continent to continent. They still wouldn't have been face to face. But on top of that, they weren't even alive at the same time on this planet. Yet there's the same nemesis all the way through. There's the same hero all the way through. There's this story in chronological order of a God who had a perfect relationship with men and women because it was his most prized creation. Man and woman chose to sin. They were separated from God, and God always had a plan to restore them back as if they were perfect again through his son Jesus. And these guys, no way they could have ever compared to anything. I tell you, this book is a book that holds water. But the thing that probably is most astounding to me, I was 24 years old before I surrendered my life to Christ, and I'm telling you, this book has some, some huge claims. A virgin having a baby? I mean, multiple things. It seems more like science fiction to the human mind. 
But I want you to look at the manuscript evidence for just a moment. The manuscript evidence on the bottom part of your sheet, look at the second bullet point there. The Iliad by Homer is the most documented secular book in history. The Iliad, okay? As a matter of fact, here's why. Because there are 643 surviving copies that date 500 years after the original. Now, here's what that means. This was before the day of the printing press where you could put something on and know it was going to be duplicated exact. That means 643 men who have air could look, read, and they rewrote Iliad. 643 different people rewrote that. And I'll promise you when you put those 643 existing manuscripts on top of one another, so to speak, and compare them, you know what Homer was writing. Because you'll see some differences here and there, but you're going to see all the stuff that was exactly right. Because even with human error, you go, okay, wow, that's, that's it. It's kind of like if your great-great-great-grandma had this unbelievable chocolate chip cookie recipe, and you lost the original. But thank God, 52 people in the family over the last four generations hand-wrote that. Okay? And you had all 52 of those. If you compared those, I'll promise you, by seeing what lined up, you would know what Granny was cooking. Okay? And that's the way it is with the Iliad, 643 times. It's impressive. It's incredibly impressive. The second most documented book is Caesar's Gallic Wars, where there are 10 manuscripts. The third most is Herodotus, where there are eight uh, copies dating uh, 1,300 years after the original. But again, eight different men rewrote that book, and even only eight is enough to be able to see what was the, what was the book originally about. What did they say word for word? Well, I want you to know that I have here a couple of examples. I had a little extra time on my hands. This is the Iliad. This is 643 sheets of paper, okay? I cheated. There's a ream of 500, all right? I only had to count to 143. Took me longer than it should have, all right? But I can tell you, this is what the Iliad would look like. And I'm taking nothing away from that. That is impressive that 643 different people wrote that, Okay? Here would be Caesar's Gallic Wars, 10. Here would be Herodotus, 8, okay? Can't tell the difference between, you know, from the naked eye, really, because there's only two sheets different. I'm going to try not to take my sermon notes off of that. But here is the Iliad. This is the big boy. Now, I want to compare that to the Bible. In the Old Testament, there's not 643. There's 6,000. In the New Testament, there's not 643. There's 24,000 existing manuscripts. And by the way, since the Dead Sea Scrolls, they date 120 years after the originals. This is 500 years after the originals. So we can look at this picture. Here's what that looks like. The left, that's mostly yellow, would be the Old Testament compared to this. And the right, that's mostly blue, would be the New Testament compared to this. One time I stacked those all the way up, the New Testament. It just doesn't work that way very easy. I can tell you, I've still got scars. But it was 10 feet, 7 and 3 quarter inches tall. And this is the Iliad that I take nothing away from. But I want to tell you, there's not another book anywhere, anywhere that, that the Bible doesn't absolutely smother with the manuscript evidence. And they took those manuscripts and they put them on top of one another, 6,000 deep and 24,000 feet deep for comparison. And there's a 99... 0.9% perfect rate. Now, I say the Bible's inerrant. You may say, hit the brakes, 99.9 is not without error. Well, I'm going to tell you where the differences were found. It's as if I, if I said to you, and, and this is true, my older sister texted me yesterday. She did. And then later on, I said to you, my sister texted me yesterday. What did I leave out? I never leave that out because I like the fact that she's older, okay? And I always throw that in there. But I'm just saying it doesn't take anything away from the truth that my sister texted me yesterday. So the difference is not anything that takes anything away from truth. I'm telling you, the Bible absolutely smothers any other book. And I'm not taken away from the other books. I'm just saying this book has been preserved I have university students. I have the privilege to be able to serve around a lot of them on secular campuses. And as I'm sharing with them, they'll say to me, I, I just, I can't trust the Bible. And I say, why? Because it was written by man. And, and again, I, we've already talked about it. I don't believe it's written by man. I believe the evidence is overwhelming that it's written by God. But I'll say to them, what's your major? And they'll say, accounting, whatever. I say, do you have a library on campus? And of course, they look at me like I have four heads. Although if you would have seen my grade point average at SBU, you would know that I wasn't sure we had a library on campus. 
But I say to them, whatever you do, don't read any of those books in that library. And they'll look at me and I say, they've all been written by men and women. You can't trust those. But see, we'll take any other book and write it down on a test like it's, you know, what we're going to build our career on, but it just doesn't carry water. For that argument, won't hold water. But I believe that the Bible has been preserved. It's been preserved. Um, from time to time, we used to go into an area of Houston, Texas, where it had the highest concentration of, of atheists, where they would go and kind of party and hang out and... We weren't there to debate or get into an argument. And honestly, we would, by far and away, the majority of the time, in on completely separate pages. But, you know, I still like them, and I think they like me. We weren't debating it. I just wanted to be able to see. And by the way, everyone's created in God's likeness, His image. Amen? So they're precious to God. So it's not about some ugly debate, and I'm going to prove you wrong. But I, I was always fascinated to hear what they had to say as well. Although I believe, hear, hear me, that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And so, I, I would go down, me and some friends, and, and we would begin to share. And we would do a survey, and the last question of the survey was, do you have any religious background? And most of them was yes. And they would say, I was Baptist, or I was Catholic, or, you know, different things. And I would say, what has brought you to the conclusion that there's no God? Connect the dots there. And they would tell me their story. And then at the end, I would say, and I learned this from a much smarter man than me, I would say, look, uh, I, you know... Well, first of all, let me just say, what they're expecting from me and what they're expecting from us is intellectual integrity. In other words, they don't want my faith. They really want one plus one equals two. And so I would say to them, is it okay if I expect the same from you? Not your philosophy, intellectual integrity. They'd say, absolutely. I'd say out of all truth to be learned and retained about the entire universe, would you think it'd be fair... For me to say that you've actually learned and retained 50%, one half of all truth about the universe. And they would go, that's absurd. And I'd go, okay, I agree. So what, what's the percentage? What would you give yourself? And everyone but one said, less than 1%. And I said, okay, so let's say you're the smartest person on the planet and you're at 3%. You've learned and retained three out of every 100 things, truth to be learned and retained about the universe. Is it possible? Is possible that in the 97% that you have not yet learned and retained that God exists, that he's head over heels in love with you and meets you right where you are. He loves you the way you are. He loves me too much to keep me the way I am. But he'll meet you right to the point of your need. Came in the form of Jesus, 100% man, 100% God, born of a virgin, died for you and rose again. A lot of times they go, okay, okay, you got me. I said, no, 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 I'm not trying to get you. I'm just saying, is it possible? And they'd say, well, it's got to be possible. I'd say, well, here's what I want you to do. And I'd give them the gospel of John. And I'd say, I want you to read this. If, if it's possible, I mean, something, eternity, that big, that huge, that important. If it's even possible, I want to ask you to read this. And I want you to pray this prayer every day. And their eyebrows would go up. I'd go, no, 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 listen to the prayer. God, I don't even think you're out there. But if you are, prove yourself. I don't think you're there. But if you are, God... Make yourself known. And that's where we would part conversations. But I want to tell you, I'm not here to try to make the gospel completely make sense. Because there is a faith component to the gospel. And there is a faith component to this book. And even though I believe this book can be proven, and highly intellectual people that do a deep dive will find this book is true. But I still have to tell you, we can never take faith out of the picture. Because here's what this story states. This story from this book that I believe is on my heart can be proven. This story states that in the Garden of Eden, man and woman had a perfect relationship with God. It was perfect. They walked hand in hand with God. There was no illness. There was no death. Then the man and woman chose to sin, and sin brings separation and death. So they had to leave the garden and ended up dying but I want to tell you, God never forgot the perfect relationship he once had with his favorite creation, people. And he always had a plan in place to restore us back, believe it or not, in his eyes, to perfection with him. Only in his eyes, to perfection with him. And so what did he do? Well, he knew that we needed to be rescued 100% of the way, not 99.9. .9, because any iota of sin disqualifies us. 
And even if I could stop sinning now, and I can't, I'm not justifying or excusing it away, but I'll never be perfect. Even if I could stop sinning now, I've already sinned, so I'm disqualified. So he knew we needed to be rescued 100%. And he sent the rescuer, his only son, born of a virgin, walked on this earth for 33 years, 100% God, yet 100% man. Now those were two hurdles at age 24 that I had to clear. How does a virgin have a baby? How do you have 100% God yet 100% man? And I want to tell you, I had to ask two fundamental questions. Question number one, do I believe there's a God? And I always have. And I don't mean this sarcastically, but I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I just don't. Eight billion people on the planet, no two fingerprints alike. Uh, All the intricate details of this incredible planet. You know, there's over a billion cells in every body in this room, and one cell is more complex than New York City. I just don't believe that this happened by some cosmic accident. There's got to be a master designer out there somewhere. I've always believed there was a God. I don't drive by an incredible skyscraper in New York and go, wow, I wonder when that poofed up there. I know somebody designed that. Somebody built that. And I believe with all my heart, there's somebody that's in control. And he's written this book that tells us where we came from, what went wrong, is there any hope, and where are we headed from here? And those are questions that we all want to have the answers to. But... The virgin birth. So I asked, do I believe there's a God? My answer, yes. Second question I had to ask, can God do anything? I believe there's a God, so can God do anything? And if he cannot do anything, then he's not God. And if I could figure him out, he wouldn't be much of a God. So there are a couple of components we must embrace by faith. I didn't have to throw my brain out the window to become a follower of Jesus. There's more intellectual evidence of such than anything that's ever happened on the planet. But I believe in the virgin birth because God's God and I'm not and he can do anything. I believe he was here 100% God yet 100% man for 33 years because God's God and I'm not and he can do anything. And by the way, by the way, what better way could God prove to us that he gets us than to become us? Not on a two-week mission trip, thank God for those, but for 33 years. The Bible says, and always like we are tempted, he was tempted. Now, the book of James says God cannot tempt nor be tempted. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not because Jesus was 100% God, but 100% what? Man, so it wasn't the deity of Christ being tempted. It was the humanity of Christ being tempted. And he was tempted and always like we are tempted. Temptation is not sin. It's what I do with the temptation or not that becomes sin or not. He didn't give in. He didn't sin. But he knows the difficulty of temptation. When you cry yourself to sleep, he gets it. And when you have victory, he gets it. When you have failure, he gets it. He was here for 33 years hanging out with us. And then he died on a cross. The Bible says the only thing big enough to cover my wicked sin was his pure, precious blood. He was the perfect lamb of God. But he didn't stay dead because on the third day later, he rose from the dead. Whenever he did those things, he defeated death and hell for all of us. And if any man, woman, boy, or girl will come before him and just say, God, I'm stuck. God bless to spread the word. Hallelujah.